Hey everybody, Dave Lindbergh in Hong Kong with another episode of THD Podcast. Today we have a company joining us from Montreal that, if I understand correctly, they're using the feedback loop to detect sensing in an in-ear for things like biometric feedback and in-ear detection when people are wearing their earbud. Uh, but before we get into that, let's not forget about our sponsor, the Alti Association, so Audio Loudspeaker Technology International. They'll be hosting a meeting suite at CES in the Venetian this coming year. So a new uh, little mini expo for embedded technologies coming up. So we encourage everybody to watch this space and make sure to come see us all at uh, CES. So without delay, uh, Simon's in from Japan again this morning. Good morning, Simon. Morning, morning all. And uh, I guess evening for you, Mohammed. Yeah. So Mohammed Ashraf, is that how we pronounce it? Yep. Okay. Okay. So, so, oh, Mike, uh, there's been a lot of stuff going on in audio in Montreal lately. So, so yeah, we found out about oh, Mike, and we wanted to find out about uh, what you guys are up to. So, uh, maybe introduce yourself, uh, Mohammed. Sure. Sure. Um, thank you, uh, David and Simon, for having me on here. It's uh, it's exciting. Um, so, oh, Mike is is um, is a startup in Montreal. Uh, that's uh, that's developing this technology uh, to actually use the existing infrastructure and headphones to kind of realize the features we've always wanted to. Um, so we've seen a lot of headphone technologies recently in the past couple of years have um, heart rate or insertion detection or, um, I mean, now buttons are taken for granted. So interfacing is, is expected in headphones. But uh, the underlying notion is that all of these things require hardware. For every feature you need, you need a component, but it doesn't really have to be that way. And that's, that's our entire methodology. It's that uh, you have everything you need in, in, in the driver and in, in the headphone uh, and the hardware's already there. And as long as you leverage that data in, in, in a clever way, you, know, you can get all these features. So okay. that's what we're trying to do. Okay, cool. So maybe... Just to visualize things for people, let's uh, jump into a presentation to, to introduce mm -hmm. the technology. So <clears throat> this is Omic. Um, we are based in Montreal, as uh, David said. Uh, we, we secured funding from Tandem Launch um, last year. And um, our team has grown up to uh, eight engineers so far. And we... Um, we're working really hard day and night to develop a technology that I'm going to talk about in the future to kind of revolutionize uh, headphones. And, and that's ultimately what uh, the entire company is about, headphone technology and how we can we can make it smarter. Okay. So <clears throat> maybe we can start from the beginning. Uh, our team members consist of the core team, which is um, the product lead, I, uh, who handles business development, things like, like that. And Dr. Carlos uh, Mendes Jr. He's a technical lead. He has a PhD in integrated circuit design. Um, and Emily Potros, uh, Tandem Launch's uh, general partner and someone who's been supporting us every step of the way of this startup because startups aren't easy, as you, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also lucky enough to have an engineering team of biomedical engineers, analog circuit designers, and Dr. Danilo Peña, who has a PhD in signal processing for um, uh, echo cancellation and, and, and noise. Mm -hmm. uh, so right up our alley. Uh, he's actually from Portugal uh, working remotely, but the work he's been doing has been pivotal in actually denoising and removing interference mitigation. Okay. So uh, maybe we can start with the landscape that we're working with. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of competition around in, in headphones. It's, it's kind of a competitive landscape, uh, again, as you know. And right now, there's a lot of intersection between headphones as a wearable and some industries like wellness, for example, and uh, health. And these are large industries, you know, they're, they're not small, they're, they're in the billions. And, and um, the way they intersect is through integrating different features, like for example, gesture recognition, insertion detection, user identification, and heart rate. Uh, but as I said before, these features come with drawbacks. You know, you don't get a free lunch in engineering. Mm -hmm. And some of these drawbacks are slimmer profit margins, expensive products, 
uh, a far reduced battery life and an increase in e-waste. And what that means is that we essentially, through OMIC, uh, have an opportunity from this problem uh, because we can provide a low cost, uh, low power uh, way to enable all these features without the added weight of these components. Right. I think uh, just, just for people watching, they should understand that there were some people using PPG technology, I guess, three, four years ago, Jabra, Bose, and Philips, yeah. that launched products. And I, I know that the, the Bose product maybe shipped a, a half a million units total. And for Bose, that's basically a failure. Um, so mm -hmm. a lot of it was that people just didn't see the functionality and, and the, the added cost benefit to add that to their earphones. So I think... I think for people to understand the summary here, what you guys are doing is trying to, to battle that bomb cost implication so that people kind of have these features with the existing hardware that's in the device. Yeah, I completely agree. So, so the thing is, you know, um, when you add that cost, someone has to pay for it. And when the users pay for it, they expect to see something in return. Um, and having heart rate sensing, it's, it's, it's great, but that data doesn't really mean much without um, insights to come with it. So when you have a headphone that can deliver that data without a companion companion platform or without insights or algorithms that can that can tell you exactly um, why that data is important to you, then you ask yourself, why am I paying extra for this feature? Mm -hmm. uh, but that's one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is a technical in nature because um, when you add these PPG sensors for heart rate sensing, or um, proximity sensors for insertion detection, for example, mm -hmm. um, you, you run into a design problem where you have to make more space for the batteries because these are LEDs. You know, they're, not, they're not really passive components, um, not exactly. They take up a lot of power. Uh, and so you have to have a trade-off between uh, either battery life or size, which can lead to an uncomfortable headphone. Mm -hmm. um, especially when you talk about TWS. So, uh, it was kind of like a race where TWS was gaining a lot of share uh, and there was an expectation of different features in the wearable ecosystem uh, because nowadays wearables are, are the values in the platform. It's in the ecosystem itself rather than a single device. Um, so, so all these different dynamics, all these different interplaying forces meant that um, the headphone manufacturers had to really think hard about whether or not this component was going to add enough value to justify the cost that they're incurring and the cost that they're passing on to the user. Um, and you can see that, uh, you know, that period is, is a bit over. I mean, not that many headphones right now exist with PPG sensors yeah. because the answer was it wasn't worth it. Um, yeah. And, and there was a lot of incumbent stuff like the, the watches and, and such. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm not a hardcore athletic guy, but the people that were serious runners that I spoke to at that time said that, yeah, they're, they're all comfortable with their watch uh, for their heart rate and, and that kind of covered that space. Yeah, exactly. I agree. And that's not really stopping. I mean, you see now um, Apple Apple just got the FDA cleared for, um, for abnormal uh, heart rhythms and Fitbit just got cleared for, um, I think it was um, arrhythmia detection. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it was it was an uphill battle. I mean, you, you had to get a large sample size. I think it was close to 450,000 uh, per study um, for five months. But um, but these 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 wearables are becoming more and more accurate. The question now is what place or what position the the headphones have um, with respect to these to these devices because this is a foothold for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and and in omic especially. Uh, we ran into that problem early on where we talked about, uh, okay, so we bring in this feature, but this feature already exists. What are we going to add to the user? And we really struggled with this question of what, what new thing are we adding? And um, I, think, I think it really, really clicked with us when we found out that we weren't really competing with wearables. Rather, we were adding to the entire ecosystem as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really that we want to take away from the market share of the smartwatch. It's more that we want to increase the, the use of headphones in general, because not only can we do heart rate sensing, we can do a lot more mm -hmm. uh, than that. Uh, and so, so you get, you get into these interesting different possibilities when you think about um, 
from different data points. Uh, when you think about media, when you think about stress, and you think about uh, the fact that not everyone has a smartwatch. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting space and it's not really adding anything to the manufacturing, right. which is what takes it over the edge. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and when you say gesture recognition, that's like functional control, like the touch control uh, concept. Yeah. yeah. Touch, so, I, yeah. You so, you know, all the AirPods have that insert detections on all the AirPods, and they're using mm -hmm. they're using a like a prox sensor, like a capacitive sensor yeah. I think, for most of the touch. For yeah. the insert detection, they're using some kind of uh, maybe an infrared sensor or something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so. There's a lot of hardware in real estate because, like you said, space constraints. So if you're able to do that with the existing uh, transducer as the sensor, uh, I think you guys mm -hmm. got a good match here. That's the idea. That's the idea, David. All right. Yeah. So here's what happens in in the usual sense. Um, the headphone is always seen as an output device where the membrane or the transducer, like you said, moves back and forth because of an electrical signal. And that creates pressure waves, which we perceive as sound. But in Omic, what we do is we actually see the system as a whole. When you put on the headphone, there's a coupling between the ear canal and the membrane itself. And what that means is that bodily functions like heart rate can actually move the membrane back and forth as much as the membrane moves the ear. Mm -hmm. And so we capture that and we translate that into signals like heart rate, like insertion detection, like heart rate variability, like tapping and sliding. So all these cool features that I mentioned before. Okay. Uh, when you say you capture that, uh, how is that captured? Well, the same way that music is delivered into the ear, uh, the feedback is delivered back into the device. So our technology is able to actually isolate that, that signal. Um, that's always been there, but generally has been considered feedback and has been thrown out or filtered. Yep, okay, so it's actually uh, the uh, speaker voltage. Yeah, exactly. That is the primary signal. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Sure. So this is the phenomenon uh, as it is right now. And uh, the speaker vibrates and inside the ear canal, uh, there's a lot of different phenomena that coincide with signals that we find, like movement, like speech, like heartbeat. And when we look at the signal, it's, uh, it's very, very rich in a lot of different things. And we've only just scratched the surface. When we say heart rate, this is, to be honest, what we're comfortable telling people that we can do. But there's a lot of different profiles here that we can actually capture. Um, we... Um, we are only throttled right now by the resources that we have and by the team, because um, we think that we can get heart rate variability. Uh, we also think we can get breathing rates from there. And so putting these into models that can infer, for example, uh, engagement, movement, things like that, uh, can lead to a lot of opportunities in a lot of different verticals. But right now, what we're focused on is, uh, like I said before, the basic functions that users take for granted right now when integrating into headphones. So this is essentially our technology stack. Hmm. So um, uh, can I ask a couple of things? So uh, you, you've got to get the, you've got to get the signal off the uh, uh, off the speaker, uh, and then are you proposing to use like the Bluetooth chip as, as a signal processor for this signal, or uh, someone needs to add another chip? Yeah, yeah, no, Simon, you're exactly right. Uh, so right now, TWS is is, is taking over, really, um, which means that we have to find a way to integrate with uh, the Bluetooth SOCs. Um, so we're talking about the Qualcomm's, the Broadcom's, um, the, the, the guys that really put the entire system with a PCB around it. Uh, so <clears throat> what Omic wants to do is it wants to actually miniaturize its signal right now, uh, its technology right now, uh, into um, an IP block, for example, that can integrate within that chip. Mm. And so that way we can actually transmit the data back into a device and run all these cool algorithms we have on our software stack. Okay, okay. So, so primarily uh, a software-based solution. It's hardware enabled, but yes, primarily software-based. Yeah. Yeah. 
and um, uh, do you need to do some kind of signal conditioning on the uh, on your speaker signal essentially? So you're gonna have a pretty tiny uh, yeah. <laughs> heartbeat. And... Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, the, pri the the primary direction our efforts are going now in terms of research and development is mitigating uh, motion artifacts. Mm. So um, in terms of every wearable out there, motion artifacts are really the bane of our existence. Um, when you talk about an uh, optical signal for the PPG sensors, uh, a sunny day can ruin your measurements. You know? mm -hmm. uh, when, you, when you are, for example, in a spinning class, it's the ideal scenario to showcase just how effective heart rate measurements are. But that's simply because you're holding on for your life with a very stiff wrist. Uh, however, when we uh, move into sprinting, running, um, things that uh, involve flexing the wrist and uh, relative motion between the actual sensor and the wrist, then things get interesting because then uh, there's a lot of, of interpolation involved. There's a lot of guesswork involved there. And this is for everyone across the board. Um, there's a lot of techniques to get better um, phase lock loops, uh, multiple LEDs, but they all come at the cost, hardware or software based. Um, and we're no different. Uh, the difference here is that our signal is acoustic in nature. Um, so that means that no one's done work on it. Uh, it's, it's, it's new ground. Um, and we, we are really, uh, in terms of the commercial space, some of the first people to actually understand it and explain it in research it and mitigate these motion artifacts. Hmm. Okay. I, want, I wonder if the sensitivity of the diaphragm material would help. Mm. Sort of like that, that, I guess bi, it's kind of bi-directional, right? So we have acoustics going one yeah. way and then this re reflection coming back. Yeah, yeah. So uh, some of our research is going into actually um, uh, characterizing the diaphragm itself and understanding the electromechanical dynamics in play. Um, we're learning a lot about, because we're eight people, you know, so mm -hmm. everyone's got to do something. So we're learning a lot about um, the mechanical simulation. And, um, and um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of modeling involved. We're very lucky that there's been work done in, in the past involving that, both academic and otherwise. I mean, some of the people in my team have actually uh, done this before. Uh, so um, we've done something like it before. So, so we're lucky enough to actually have a, a body of work that we can build on. Uh, but uh, that being said, yeah, definitely the game's changed. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the same parameters that other wearables uh, have to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, we have to worry about transfer functions, uh, the size of the diaphragm, it's, it's, um, it's range of motion even. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like you said, it's sensitivity. So um, there's a lot of startups out there that actually do research on developing better membranes, better membrane materials. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all material scientists, but the further that research goes, the more effective our, our technology becomes because then we can hear our signal much more coherently. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. cool, okay. So <clears throat> this is our, our technology stack. This is basically a high level overview of, of how tech works. Um, but now we can talk a bit more about the business model itself. Uh, so one of the first things we did in Omic is we did a very, very small, very rudimentary survey on what exactly everyone has. So we actually went on uh, this website called Enter, Mechanical Turk, I think. And we, we got 200 people. It's very, very basic, but it gave us a starting point as to who we should target first. And what we found was uh, there are actually still some people that have wired headphones. And not just wired headphones, but over-ear headphones. It's not a lot, but it's enough. Mm -hmm. um, what that meant was that we could spend some of our resources in the beginning developing a wired dongle, uh, which is something that we actually have a few prototypes of. Uh, and what this does is that this actually plugs into the computer and you plug the 3.5 millimeter jack into it and it unlocks all these features. And it's really cool because it just means that you can get the regular headphones that you've always had and you can transform them into something smart, into a device that can read all this data. 
Um, and we just thought about all the different uh, verticals that we can attack just using this PCB. We, we, we never thought about, you know, selling it or being direct to consumer, but what we thought of is, well, we don't have to make new headphones. We can just unlock these features in existing headphones because we have what we need. And so you think about, for example, someone playing a game and whether you're streaming or whether you're just playing, you can actually plug this in and the game can interact with your heartbeat, with your heartbeat, uh, which leads to a lot of different possibilities in personalized gaming or even effective gaming, where, for example, uh, the boss um, gets stronger and stronger the more stressed out you are. Or you, yeah, or your stamina, for example, when you're sprinting is related to your heart rate. If they see that your resting heart rate is lower, they think you're healthier. And so, you know, you can avoid more stamina and vice versa. Okay. Very interesting. But then, yeah, uh, that, that's actually one of my favorites. Uh, but then we thought about other things like, for example, telehealth. Uh, like when you put on the headphone and you're talking with your doctor and effectively the doctor, you know, they can see. Um, your heart, you can, they can see a live feed of your of your heart beating while you're talking to them. So, and this is your this is your doctor, you know, this isn't just anyone. Uh, so, um, and obviously you'll be validated against something else, but it's it's a good start, you know. It's it's um it's a good way to actually get people at home to get, to be more conscious about their health and to actually get that transparency and 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 have it far easier. A lot of times um, people feel like patients when they have things, devices trapped to their body. And this isn't that, you know? So I think it's a step in the right direction. Um, same thing with employee wellness. Uh, right now I have headphones on, uh, but I had these headphones on the whole time, uh, all day. When I was in meetings, for example, and I was listening to music and focusing, uh, if these headphones could have captured my heart rate this whole time. If they could have captured my heart rate variability and my stress levels, uh, then I would have known a lot of, a lot of different things uh, and a lot about myself and, and how I react to different stressors. Like if I get an email at 450 or something, um, it's, it's, uh, it was interesting. It was interesting for us um, at least, uh, mm -hmm. but, but ultimately this is just the start. And what we really want to do is we want to capture the wireless market. And for the wireless market, this fits a bit different based on our survey but what we found is that we can actually access a lot more uh, market just because of, like I said before, TWS and uh, the mobility aspect involved there. Uh, people like wireless, especially when they're on the go, especially when they're running, especially when they're, when they're out of their house, for example, if they need to move a lot. And so you think about the exercise market and think about virtual reality or augmented reality, even when you're on the street, or, or even if you're watching a movie, for example, outside, uh, right now, there's a lot of money being spent on uh, screen testing. If you, for example, are a studio and you're producing a movie, you want to know the audience's reaction or the audience's response to that. But right now, with streaming models being what they are and everyone, you know, more people staying at home and watching releases at home, um, you know, you can think of something basic like a beta tier or a screen test tier where you get access to exclusive content uh, only if you get to watch it with these headphones. Right. And so that way, there's a lot of money spent in analytics and audience reactions. There's a lot more data at scale. It's aggregated automatically. And the people get exclusive content, which is something a lot of people I know personally, I would have loved to see this neither cut before it came out before the entire Twitter campaign. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with Batgirl. Um, I have a few friends who have seen Batgirl and, you know, no one else can see it now. So that's a missed opportunity for sure. <laughs> All right. Just quickly, that um, uh, that wired dongle is that commercially available, or is that uh, just a proof of concept? Not yet. Uh, we're working on it now, and and we're seeing which model fits best uh, with with our trajectory. Um, but but ultimately, this dongle is something that uh, right now we're kind of testing the waters for in businesses in Montreal. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but it's 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 really a strip right now. Um, we can't say anything for certain, but uh, yeah, yeah, not the first time I had to answer that question. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> we talked a bit about the use cases, but uh, maybe we can just drill on them uh, just a bit more. 
uh, like I said before, remote patient monitoring, uh, responsive training is one that's really interesting to a lot of different people, especially human performance uh, and immersive wellness. So we're seeing a lot of different meditation apps right now uh, give you soundscapes and guided uh, guided uh, audio files and things like that. And you know, we thought of we thought of what if Omic was to partner with some of these people and actually give feedback as to whether this content is right or not. But not just give feedback to the business, but give validation to the user. Give them something like a meditation score. Give them an an, an, an incremental improvement on how well they they're doing that day. Mm-hmm. Um, this is this is an objective um, numbers based approach to wellness that doesn't exist now unless you have to buy an expensive device that really impede on uh, just your your experience in general. Okay. And um, speaking of experiences, uh, <laughs> there's a there's a huge wave coming along now with with augmented reality and virtual reality mm-hmm. and the benefit there that we like is that you know the infrastructure is already there you don't need any extra devices you don't even need a smartwatch in this case you can just put the headphones on and it can essentially give you telemetry it can give you um, that effective experience but it's not just for you it can give the creators and the curators of these experiences um, feedback so you think of a recommendation engine for games, for example. Um, this is data at a granular level that just doesn't exist right now. The closest you can get to it is a like or a dislike. And not that many people rate it. But more importantly, it doesn't tell you exactly what elements of the experience people liked or not. And that last sentence that, um, that, that, that I said, we actually, you know, we were talking about it uh, with the team and, and we found that we can actually expand on that. So it doesn't just have to be VR and AR experiences. It can be any experience. Um, if you're listening to a song on Spotify, if you're listening to a song on SoundCloud, if you're watching a YouTube video, uh, you have a second by second idea of what this person's heart rate, heart rate variability and stress is. And what that means is that you can actually understand what parts of the song, what parts of the content they liked and what parts they didn't engage with. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and, and for the and at scale. Uh, so this is just through the headphones, which you already need if you're watching it publicly or if you want to listen intently, if you want to concentrate on it. Um, and so that response analysis or that engagement feedback, um, again, isn't something that exists right now and would be really interesting um, to, to have without all the overhead. It could be kind of interesting for online poker. <laughs> 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 you can pay an extra fee to know if your uh, your, your opponents are like uh, their heart rate is changing <laughs> while they're they they got a certain hand. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. but only if your opponent knows that you can see their heart rate. Yeah, I'm being silly, but but yeah, that kind of <laughs> extended uh, data set from people's biometrics is uh, all kinds of uh, use cases, especially for the commercial stuff. Um, yeah. To, to 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 get more money out of us all. <laughs> <laughs> That's the dream, right? Yeah. <laughs> but um yeah, so all of this is is you know it has to be realized. And um and right now what we're doing is um like I said, we're working on this wired dongle. We have our eva- evaluation opportunities um with a, with a few businesses and and uh, we're looking for a pilot project to kind of showcase. Um, this this type of data and, and how how well it affects people because it's great that we sit down and dream about all this stuff but you know we actually have to put it to the test and, and this is this is our way to do it mm-hmm. um, and and since you know we are startup we're looking to to raise um, within the next year um, and the reason why we want to is because we want to explore the wireless implementation of this technology we want to develop a wireless prototype and and have eval kits that we can send out to businesses. And actually have them test this out for themselves because a they have more equipment that they can do and, and b they think about more things than us uh, we can't really think of everything we'd love to it would be great but having an external business actually rate this and, and understand this and, and test it for us and give us feedback on it will give us either validation or the direction for further development okay. and finally um 
Yeah, and finally, uh, we, we we plan on raising uh, for our Series A uh, that will give us the resources we need to actually have this implemented in an earbud uh, through either a licensing approach or making a chip ourselves. But ultimately, the idea is is the same: uh, proliferation of this technology and just passing on the value to the manufacturers, to the users, to to every every point within the value stream. Okay, question time then. <laughs> of course, um, that's all I got. Uh, uh, fundamentally, it is about uh, sensing vibration-related data. Yeah. Uh, um, and so that relates to heart rate and what else? So uh, heart rate is, is the fundamental one. Um, but through heart rate, because the data is granular, we can get heart rate variability, which is simply the interval between one peak and the other. And the change between those intervals, a collection of those intervals within a specific window. Mm -hmm. um, we can also get through the vibration um, and notice if you tap or if you slide up and down, left and right, whichever one you need. And um, we know when you have the headphone on or not. The reason why we know that is um, because of the noise floor. So we know exactly whether uh, the signal is a signal of someone wearing the headphone or not. It's a very simple classification algorithm. Mm. Um, we run some signal processing and, you know, we collect some data and that's that. Okay, so uh, yeah, you, you've got the vibration. I think you got wear detection and uh, tap detection, this kind of thing. Yeah, that's we actually, also have that's actually quite a nice one. Possibly a little bit easier on the yeah, signal to noise issue too. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, we actually have uh, identity verification too. But um, so so that one's actually pretty clever. Um, we when you put it on because we have wear detection. What happens is that we're able to essentially isolate. Well, we know we know when you have it on. So the next step would be, for example, to play a tune, and the echo from that tune gives us uh, something like a transfer function of the ear canal. And the geometry of the of a person's ear canal from one person to the other is quite unique. Um, so that means that we can actually get a unique signal for a user at least and verify whether that user is the vice owner or not. Mm -hmm. And um, if someone wants to implement this type of technology, is it likely that they would have to do a characterization of their specific headphone, some calibration procedures? Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. So um, it's, it's, not, it's not unlike the calibration of a face ID on the iPhone, for example, when you first take it out of the box or when you uh, reset it. So, um, similar to a fingerprint as well. So all of these things are data collection methods for calibration, just like you said, Simon. And, um, and you know, we're no different. Uh, if you're verifying someone, you have to get to know them, right? And, uh, and I think that's, that's the core of the technology. Now, I do have to say though, that identity verification is uh, a bit further down the road, just because uh, A, we wanna make sure that this, this signal is, is quite coherent enough for us, but, but B, uh, for a device to adopt this, for a mobile device especially to adopt this, it takes a lot of validation testing. Um, it takes, and it's not just accuracy, it's more the F score. Uh, so we wanna make sure that not only no errors, but there's no false positives or false negatives. Mm -hmm. uh, false positives are the problem. They're what gets you because you don't wanna allow the phone for someone that isn't device owner. So, we need to make sure that the recall and the precision are up to standards. And we're talking one in every maybe 10 or 100,000. So it's a long ways away. Hmm. All right. Yeah, I was just thinking, so the, this um, uh, implementation of uh, wearing detection just by using this, uh, you know, this feedback system actually struck me as being something that is uh, relatively simple, especially compared to detecting heart rate and uh, extremely valuable. Um, that's very interesting. Do you have uh, IP protection around what you've got? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes we do. Excellent. Cool. Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, definitely the adding the in-ear detection with existing hardware um, 
there's, yeah, like I said, there's the capacitive touch guys doing in-ear detection. There's infrared doing in-ear detection. And they're all taking real estate, all taking power consumption. And everybody knows you got this little tiny battery trying to do all these functions in your ear, plus play your, play your songs and take your phone calls. Um, it's, Any sense of how the, uh, uh, in terms of power consumption, how that might differ with a sensor? Because you still need to be running some kind of an ADAC or something the whole time, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, Simon, you're absolutely right. Um, so so the solution really wouldn't make sense if it consumes more power than LEDs, right? Um, well, maybe maybe not, because you still save a lot of space by not having a sensor. True, true. But um, we really don't want to... Like, so right now, what we did was we bought... We bought uh, headphones or earbuds that sense your your heart rate from a few vendors. Mm-hmm. A lot of them didn't work. Some of them are discontinued, and the ones that did lasted for maybe half an hour to forty five minutes. So, so you can imagine the kind of oh, power the, the sensor burned up the battery in that time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's... Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's a bright light, you know. It's it's a really bright green yeah. light, and uh, that's what it takes, I guess. Well, it, that that kind of illustrates how long I exercise because I have some heart rate. Um, <laughs> I never went more than half an hour, apparently. <laughs> is it is it a heart rate uh, headphone? Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Which uh, which if you don't mind me asking, which one? Oh, uh, it was it was a a, a, a I I don't know. I think I heart or something like this. I'm trying to look across the room. I got a stack of sample boxes over there, but I can put it in the I can put it in the description here um, after the video. Yeah, but it's no longer in production. But at any rate, all right. Yeah. So, have you got any more questions? Um, no, I think we covered it. All right. So people can. What's the What's the URL to find out more about your company, Mohammed? Sure. It's uh, omic.ai. O h m i c. Dot AI. Okay. And uh, yeah, we'll put some information down below further to that for people to uh, follow up and find out more information as this, this uh, I guess, development project uh, looks towards commercialization is kind of where you're at right now, it sounds like. Sure. Uh, thank you. I, I really appreciate this. And uh, yeah, uh, like David said, if anyone wants to know more, uh, just visit the website. Uh, there's contact information there. And yeah. All right. Okay. So thanks everybody for joining us today and thanks for watching everybody and please like subscribe, share notification, all those good things. Um, So yeah, thanks. We'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for your time. See you next time.